Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're very lucky to be joined by Philip Lubin, who's come up to us from UC Santa Barbara, where he's a professor in the Department of Physics. He's uh, also the head of the UC Santa Barbara Experimental Physics Group. His uh, interests uh, lie around uh, experimental cosmology, uh, satellite and balloon and ground-based studies of the early universe. Uh, he's interested in looking at uh, the cosmic microwave background, uh, its spectrum, uh, anisotropy and polarization. Uh, he's also uh, interested in uh, galaxy cluster cooling uh, uh, and uh, uh, Sunyaev uh, Zeldovich effect measurements. Uh, and today, Philip's going to talk to us about uh, a slightly different uh, topic um, about uh, using beam power for planetary defense. Uh, and he's also going to touch on the SETI aspects of uh, this technology. So please, uh, please join me in welcoming Philip. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, minor correction. I'm not head of the uh, experimental effort at UC Santa Barbara. There is no such person. Uh, uh, we're all anarchists by nature, so <laughs> one would not ascribe a leader to that uh, that motley crew. Uh, as much as I love my colleagues, one, one could not say uh, that there's a head of it. Okay, I think everything else you said was was within reason. Uh, so I'm going to talk. Uh, uh, first of all, I noticed the orientation here. So to my right, which I guess is the the red states people, uh, it's less represented, so I'm not sure if there's a diversity issue here, but to my left, which is the blue, um, I suppose is appropriate for the Bay Area. So <laughs> I lived in Berkeley for many years, so I can say such things. Okay, uh, so I have much more to present than I can possibly fit into this talk, so if you want to hang out for three hours, I'd be happy to engage you. Um, what I hope to uh, convince you of is that Many things I'm going to talk about are, are inevitable consequences of our technological evolution and in many ways should be seen in a proper light, not just in the here now, but in the sense of what's possible in the future. So most of us are, are hung up, I think, on the today. Um, so you go out today, you see the beautiful day, the flowers are coming out here. It's really quite a remarkably beautiful environment. Um, but I'd ask you to go back in your mind to a hypothetical uh, Silicon Valley of 100 years ago. So the year is 1914. Um, and ask yourself, what was this region like? And where were we technologically? And then I'd ask you to go back 200 years ago to 1814 and ask yourself the same question. And that's a very small time scale on the um, map of, of human evolution, let alone uh, cosmological evolution, and then run the clock forward, and we'll do a little bit of this, 100 years, 200 years, and ask yourself, what is it going to be like? And if you think it's going to be like today, the only thing I can tell you is you're absolutely wrong. And that I can say with certainty. What it's going to be like, I can't say, but I can say it's not going to be like today. Okay, so uh, please open your minds. Um, as Timothy Leary once said, just don't let it fall out the other side. <laughs> okay, so I'll try to go to the right, to the left. If you have political commentary, um, feel free. So just some nice quotes from uh, people that uh, have all kinds of uh, good things to say in history. This is a nice one uh, from Niels Bohr to Wolfgang Pauli. Uh, we all agree that your theory is crazy. The question divides us whether it's crazy enough. Um, <laughs> There's one by uh, Einstein. If you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. Okay? <laughs> Just something you might want to think about. Okay. Uh, then here's a, a nice uh, uh, quote from the uh, head of NASA. Um, the answer to you is if it's coming in three weeks, that being a, a boloid, uh, then I can help you pray. Uh, and that's about it. Okay. And this is a great one by uh, General Shelton that we're uh, less capable under sequestration. So I don't know if any of you <laughs> have thought about that or not. But uh, and this is a good one, of course, pay now or pray later. Uh, and this is, uh, I thought, a very nice one, again, from Einstein. And this one, for this audience, I think is probably the most important. Imagination is more important than current knowledge is what, what was meant there. 
for knowledge, current knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces something far beyond. All right, stimulating progress, giving birth to evolution, strictly speaking, a real factor in scientific research. So, um, loosen up a little bit, you know, if you want to do some Tai Chi or whatever you're into, um, you might want to think about it. Uh, we've published uh, quite a bit so far, and we have a number of other articles, uh, either in press or in preparation. Uh, some of this you can find on our website, which is up at the top there. And you can find uh, some of the articles already published. A number of the articles um, are in either press or in preparation. And there'll be several others coming beyond that this year. So as you know, uh, we live in a, a pretty rough neighborhood. There's a lot of drive-by um, drive activity. <laughs> and uh, sometimes uh, it can be, uh, be dangerous. Yeah. So there's lots of, lots of pretty pictures here. But you know, we live in an area which uh, has a lot of uh, debris floating around. And occasionally, the debris uh, comes and hits us. On an average day, let's hope today is an average day, we will be hit with about 100 tons of debris. It's just that it comes in relatively small uh, uh, sub-elements, small pieces. And so that debris just burns up in the atmosphere. Once in a while, we get hit by a 100-ton thing. Uh, in one, one chunk, and then it's not so pleasant. But as long as it's finely divided, uh, it's not so bad. So you can say divide and conquer is a good thing to take out of this. Anyway, there's lots of pictures you can find. This is not my general area, but there's lots of material out there. If you look out from the sun, going out in the solar system, you find uh, significant, significant layers of debris um, concentrated in some areas and less so in others, presumably from breakup of, of planets didn't quite make it. And lots of intersecting orbits. If you plot the orbits of some of the asteroids and other material out there, it's not a very good rendition. It's Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. You can see you know, there's a lot of possibilities for intersections, and you just don't want to be at that intersecting point if you can avoid it. So here's a, a plot of hit rate versus diameter. And this is the accumulative number of collisions with the Earth per year um, as a function of the energy in, in kilotons. And I'll show you more of this later. And then a rough, and is there a pointer? Um, no pointer. No pointers? OK. Yeah, I don't know if this is. OK, here's the equivalent diameter at the top in, uh, in meters. Um, so this assumes a sort of typical um, uh, uh, you know, energy based on the velocity coming in, which is typically a order of 10 to 60 kilometers per second. Their speed around the sun average is 30 kilometers per second. So if you look at a 100 meter class object coming in, which comes in around you know, once every few hundred to thousand years, it comes in with an energy of roughly a megaton or a thousand kilotons. Okay? And if you think back in the last 100, roughly 100 years, uh, Russia's been hit uh, twice, which is clearly a, uh, a conspiracy <laughs> and obviously <laughs> orchestrated by the West. Uh, once in Tunguska before the revolution, we didn't even wait for the revolution, uh, and then once uh, last year. So the Tunguska event was pretty significant, it was of order 10 megatons or so, which is larger than the largest uh, strategic class weapon in at least the US arsenal, um, whereas the one that happened over Russia last year was about half a, <coughs> half a megaton, which is sort of the um, yield of a typical strategic weapon, actually a bit larger than the US equivalent. Anyway, there's lots of stuff out there. I'm not going to bore you with this, because I actually want to get on to the more interesting stuff. But there are lots of uh, boloids out there. And you can look up, find what's the uh, information known about things that are going to come by. Of course, it's the ones that don't, that we don't know about, which are probably the more dangerous. Here's some <coughs> recent asteroid misses. Um, this one was last year. OK, this came by in May of 2013. And it safely passed us with about a 4 million mile uh, closest approach. All right, and this is a radar image out of MIT. This one actually has a, um, a small moon around it. It's actually quite beautiful. Yes. 
Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. Um, yes, so Michael's an expert in radar if you want to get some questions answered on radar detection. Um, anyway, there are lots of, uh, lots of things out there, lots of detections that are happening. So this is a New Year's, New Year's 2014. This is relatively recent. Um, this was uh, more or less first of the year. And you can see the asteroid sort of whizzing by in the background compared to the background stars. Okay. So there's quite a few of these. Um, this was an airburst over the Atlantic. It was two to three meters in diameter. Um, not particularly hazardous. You know, you wouldn't build a defense system to take this out in general. If it landed on you, it would be a problem. But in general, it's not a problem. Okay. Okay. Uh, another one. This was uh, September. Um, this was the 15-meter uh, uh, discovered, uh, I guess, nine hours before it hit. Um, similar to the Russian event in February. Okay, so these things are not that infrequent, and a lot of them we just don't know uh, until they're upon us that they're even coming in. And that's part of the problem is we lack knowledge, which is really a fundamental problem. Okay, so you're all familiar with the Russian event. Um, this was uh, about a, um, a 19 kilometer per second estimate, uh, which, is, which is quite fast. It's uh, around Mach 30 or so equivalent, about a half megaton yield. Okay. Again, so these are non-trivial yields. Uh, if you think of strategic nuclear weapons, had this come in at a more, um, at a different angle and hit the, hit the uh, city, you know, it would have caused a large number of deaths. Okay, that happened about um, 16 hours before DA-14 uh, came in. This is 2012 DA-14, which was one that we knew was coming. This one we did track, we knew it was coming. This is a 50 meter approximately uh, diameter. The Tunguska event was of the, roughly the same size, and it was a 15 megaton airburst. And an airburst is a particularly um, nasty way to, uh, to distribute the energy. Uh, from 1975 to 92, if you look at the U.S. early warning system, there was about 140 what they call major upper atmospheric events, most likely from uh, asteroids burning up in the upper atmosphere, large meteorites. Okay, so these are things that we do know about. Here's DA-14 uh, coming in. You can see the trajectory. Uh, here's the Earth. comes inside the um, geosynchronous ring, which is where you get your satellite TV from. Um, and, you know, so it came relatively close to the Earth. And this would have been uh, a major problem. So if you play football, this is a nice representation of, uh, of going long, if you like to uh, <laughs> go long in a football game. Uh, it's just that these things are coming in at speeds which are, you know, up to Mach 100. And it's a bad day, uh, particularly if you're in that stadium. Uh, you would not do well. So we've been working on a, a directed energy program that we started about three years ago now. Um, and we happened to release a white paper and had a very tiny press release on February 14th. Um, but I woke up the next morning and I thought someone was playing a joke on me, but then found it wasn't quite a joke. And Russia had been hit um, by an asteroid. Uh, and uh, so the bottom line is uh, just don't do it, OK? <laughs> unless you want to be hit with uh, a massive amount of attention, which you may not want. So these are about 35,000 points of impact that have happened over the last 4,000 years based on uh, sampling. And as you can see, whoever's shooting at us is very clever. They just happen to shoot at the United States and Russia and you know, other places. Of course, that's not correct. Right? We don't find the ones in the ocean in general. We find the ones on land. I want to make sure you're paying attention. OK, large scale impacts. Uh, the dinosaurs did not die because they were playing with their um, mobile devices, contrary to public opinion, which some of you may. Um, but, and they didn't die from smoking um, or doing drugs or whatever else they were doing at the time. We think they died because a um, 10 kilometer diameter asteroid came in and basically just yielded about 100 teratons of energy and wiped them out. So it was a really bad day on Earth that day. Um, 
And that's what you would consider an existential threat to life. It certainly was an existential threat to, uh, to dinosaur life, which was a good thing for us. So one thing you might want to ponder if you're a philosopher, um, which uh, physicists used to be natural philosophers, but then we got booted out of that camp, so now we're just physicists, <laughs> is if we killed the dinosaurs and we came, maybe it's not such a bad thing. You know, maybe we should just reboot. I mean, after Microsoft used to be here, you could just hit Control Alt Delete, you know, and reboot life, and then maybe what comes next will be better. I don't know. So it's something to think about. Maybe we should do nothing. Just wait. So about 35 million years ago in the Chesapeake Bay, um, there's a 85-kilometer uh, crater which has been found. So another impact, most likely. And then if you look at the uh, largest known volcanoes, we believe that those yielded about 240 gigatons. So a gigaton is 1,000 megatons. Is If you look at the total world's arsenal of nuclear weapons, um, it's on the order. It, it decreases because we've been disarming in general, except for a small couple of rogue nations out there. But in general, there's an order uh, 10,000 or so uh, nuclear weapons. A uh, larger number of tactical ones, but strategic side, it's less than less than 10,000, and they're all in sort of the few hundred kiloton uh, up to maybe megaton range. Um, so these yields are enormous by comparison to the uh, Earth's arsenal. So what do we know about asteroids? They tend to be uh, large, relatively dark, coming in at speeds, as I said, of order um, 30 to to of order 100 or so. Uh, they can be quite dark. Uh, they have about 10%, probably 10% reflection in the visible is not unusual. They can be rubble piles or they can be uh, solid, but typically larger ones are rubble piles, as I'll talk about later. And they can be composed of all kinds of uh, things. You know, they can be carbon rich, which are called carbonaceous. They can be silicate rich, silicon, and then just in general, metal rich. Um, and temperatures are typically of order 200 Kelvin. Um, at about 2.2 uh, AU from, uh, from the sun. Okay, so there's different images shown here, a combination of, you can see them in radar, you can see them in the visible, and you can see them in the infrared. Okay. Um, it's just that we don't know uh, where, they're really, where they are yet um, well enough to be comfortable. So this is what I, one of my favorite uh, cartoons. This is kind of where we are at the moment with situational awareness. Uh, if you're into military parlance and someone's shooting at you, luckily they don't have very good aim. But this is where we are. Okay. So how do we detect asteroids? Well, it's very easy. You just ask Congress to mandate um, that they be detected, and then voila, they're detected. It's really quite simple. We live in a, in a time which is quite miraculous. We just ask Congress to mandate something and it happens. So in 2005, Congress mandated that we should uh, catalog um, all near-Earth objects that are right around 1 AU um, from the sun that are greater than one kilometer in diameter. And voila, you know, money appears, the, the uh, scientists get busy, and uh, out comes data. So there's a large number of ways this is done. Uh, again, uh, radar, optical, some infrared, uh, there's more stuff coming. There's LSSD coming up, which would be a large-scale uh, survey of the sky and the optical, the visible band. Then the B612 Foundation, which is not too far from here, uh, as I recall, uh, is hoping to field a thermal, approximately thermal infrared uh, mission, so that would be very nice. And the uh, wise the Wide Field Infrared Explorer just got reactivated by NASA to look for uh, some uh, modest class of asteroids. So the bottom line is that we, we believe that we now know we're about 90% of all asteroids greater than a kilometer, kilometer are that are of threat. So we're not so worried about that. So forget that. Okay, so NEOWISE, which was a, a cryogenic uh, mission, was launched in 2009. Um, small telescope, you know, kind of yay big, um, used uh, uh, silicon arsenic, arsenic dope silicon detectors in the uh, 12 and 22 micron band. It's much more sensitive than a mission I worked on, the COBE satellite. Um, and they observed a, a large number of rocky bodies, okay, and discovered lots of stuff. Anyway, 
uh, this worked really well. Um, unfortunately, it didn't find everything we liked, but it worked extremely well. It's now been reactivated uh, just very recently. Um, plants to run to at least 2017, uh, being passively cooled and observing in the three to five micron band. Okay. So this helps. Um, if you're interested, you can look online. Um, and it found its first new asteroid um, on January 7th. Okay, so this is good. This is all good stuff. Okay, so again, lots of um, lots of beautiful diagrams. You can see what a typical um, potentially hazardous um, asteroid versus a near-Earth asteroid looks like relative to our orbit. Okay, and you you're not really worried about something that misses you. Uh, just like a car that could potentially hit you, you worry about when it hits you. So if you look at a census of, of what's known, we know essentially where all the big ones are that are a threat to us anyway. Um, we know about half of the maybe 500 to 1,000 meter class. And then as we get smaller, we know less and less. Okay? But even a 100 meter class asteroid is still extremely dangerous. So we'd like to know uh, where these are, and then we've got to figure out what we can do about them, if anything. So detection, um, the good news is we're getting much better in detection. So if you look at the number as a function of year, you can see them uh, increasing them being, our ability to detect increases with time. Why? Because we're working much harder at it. So if you look here, you can see the rate of detection of all near-Earth asteroids is increasing dramatically. Why? Because we're <coughs> taking it much more seriously and the technology is becoming appropriate um, to detection. So in the infrared, it, um, just like your body, these things radiate. They glow, just like your body glows. You don't notice it until you look at a thermal infrared camera, but your body is glowing, and it has a peak around at about 10 microns. Well, asteroids are also warm at about 200 Kelvin or so, as I said, and they also glow. So one way to detect them is not just from the light from the sun bouncing off them, which is the typical way you detect them in the optical, or in the radar, you bounce a, a radio wave off them and look at the return signal, but you can look at their direct thermal radiation. So the B612 um, Foundation, and there was a, a previous NASA program that looked at this in a, it's kind of a similar vein, is going to try to go after this um, with a, a mission that hopefully will get funded. Um, I know they're trying to raise private funding, but hopefully the government will step in and help as well. That's, that's my personal hope. OK, there's lots of uh, asteroids out there. Most of them are carbon. Uh, we call them carbonaceous type, about 75%. Uh, the silicates are about 17%. And then about less than 10% are what are called metallics. And this is what happens when one comes in. This is a picture from Tunguska uh, in 1908. It just blew down massive amounts of, of the forest. OK, so here's your threat of dying in uh, your lifetime. So one of your biggest threats is driving. So if any of you drove a car today, that was really bad. Okay? <laughs> so I'd recommend that you walk home. But then the <laughs> probability of getting killed walking home is not trivial either. So I want you to stay here. Right? <laughs> they have good food anyway. All right, all kinds of things. So it turns out that your probability of dying in your lifetime in a passenger plane is about 1 in 20,000 which is pretty good. I mean, it's actually not bad. Much better than a motor vehicle. Right? If you drive a car, you have about 1% chance of dying in your lifetime. So it turns out the probability from asteroids are very episodic. You don't hear about people dying every year from asteroids. But if you average over the number of impacts that have happened and imagine life existed over there, it's about between 1 in 100,000 and 1 in 20,000. People debate this number, but it's of order um, one part in 10 to 100,000 100, approximately. OK, if those of you that are on the NASA side may be writing proposals. Um, your probability of dying from stress is much higher. So <laughs> you should probably just hang out here and do nothing else. So our adversary is, uh, uh, this is good and bad. So they have a very large stockpile. Okay? Uh, they have strategic devices, which are much larger than ours. Um, their tactical devices are in the megaton range. They don't negotiate. In fact, they prefer mutually assured destruction. 
Uh, they're very fast and stealthy. They hit us uh, essentially every day. Um, and we lack the ability to detect them at the moment. We're, that's changing at the moment. So now the good news is our enemy doesn't have very good sight. Uh, they don't aim very well. So we normally just dodge the bullet. They don't have any guidance systems on board except inertial guidance, which uh, if you know anything about guidance systems, you'll get the joke. Um, if you don't, don't worry. They lack countermeasures. Uh, they're deterministic. They lack intelligence. Um, they show us how they're arsenal, but they're not hiding anything under, underground. Um, and they have no strategy. They don't evolve. And we can do something about it. Okay, so the question is, you know, what do we do about it? How does that, uh, how does that reflect a, other things that we might do with the same technology? So here's the same plot, the number of hits per year versus diameter and number of hits per year versus megatons of yield. So in our modern age, we're used to thinking of megatons. So every once in a while, something like the dinosaurs, um, we wake up and 100 teratons comes in and just destroys life on Earth, at least a lot of life. It doesn't destroy all life, but it destroys a lot of life. Whereas every you know, couple hundred years, something like the Tunguska event or the so-called meteor crater or Behringer meteor uh, comes in and yields of order megatons or so. So if North, just think of, sorry about this, North Korea, didn't mean this. Okay, but you know, think of some adversary that's shooting uh, a few megatons at us every once in a while. And just ask yourself, you know, how happy would we be with that? And that's the state that we're in. Okay, so I, I got into this business uh, for other reasons having to do with non-extraterrestrial um, issues. Uh, but the basic idea is that in addition to other methods, which are completely valid and I'll talk about, um, directed energy becomes very, uh, is, is changing very rapidly. Whether you like it or not, this technology has already left the station. So you cannot put it back in the bottle. Um, you're soon going to see a world whose weaponry is going to change very dramatically. And sorry if you don't like it, but it is the way it is. So what we looked at was the possibilities of a standoff directed energy system. And as I'll describe the technology to you, um, this is now possible to, to think about and is rapidly becoming um, something which is not just possible, but is, I think, going to be an imperative for a lot of applications. So the basic idea is, in the same way that we form phased arrays of radar systems, we can begin to form phased arrays of laser systems. Same basic electromagnetic principle. And the efficiency of devices is now increased to the point where it's of order 50% conversion efficiency, which is a dramatic change from what it was even 10 years ago. So if I came here 10 years ago and gave this talk, it would have been extremely hypothetical and um, not something that one could back up with solid technology. That's no longer the case. So it's a phased array of, of lasers. Um, and our baseline, which you know, could evolve easily with technology, is ytterbium-based fibers. So if you don't know what ytterbium is, you want to invest in futures on the stock market, you want to look at ytterbium on the periodic table. Uh, the system has a large number of identical sub-elements, so they can be mass-produced. I'll talk about that a bit. It uses thin lenses as our baseline. That may change too, but at the moment, there's been some interesting work on thin holographic lenses, which is yield incredibly small aerial densities. So it's been achieved so far in the lens itself is about 60 grams per square meter. Well, if anyone in the room does optics, it's unbelievably small. Now, that is not the mount for it. That is the lens itself. So these are fiber-fed systems. The thin film optics is not required, but it's certainly nice for large systems. It's modular and scalable to any size. You can have one the size of your hand. You could have one the size of whatever, you've, whatever you can build. So it's just a matter of, of mass production and driving the cost to the point where it does what you want to do. It's a phased array, so you steer it not by pointing mechanically, um, but by uh, phase steering. Um, OK, baseline at the moment for us is a micron, just because that's where the sweet spot is technologically. There's a DARPA program uh, which has been looking at this for other purposes. 
um, and they currently have achieved a bit more than 35% wall plug efficiency. That's probably very soon to go to 50%. Um, and current goal for us is, in this system, is about a kilowatt per square meter of aerial power, which is not very much. Your body uh, emits of order 500 watts a square meter. So heat rejection, which is one of the questions that we get, is not a serious issue because we are not a very high um, concentration in terms of aerial power density. It's inherently multitasking, so you can send out multiple beams um, on targets. You can hit many targets at once. You can use it for all kinds of other things, which is what I'd like to dwell upon a little bit later in the talk. For example, you can actively illuminate asteroids and detect them. So if someone turned off the lights in the room and it was nighttime here, how would you see where you're going? What would you do? What would you do? You'd take your magic device, you'd go to the flashlight app, and you'd turn on the flashlight, right? OK, so you'd turn the lights on. So rather than just using the sun to illuminate an asteroid, you could turn on a light. So that's one thing which is possible here, much like a radar system. It turns out you can do remote composition analysis. Um, as well as mitigation. It's great for uh, photon spacecraft drive, which I'll talk about. And small systems can be immediately applicable. For example, space debris, which is a, a serious issue, uh, can be vaporized or deorbited with relatively small versions of this. So you don't have to build an Earth defending system to do something useful. You can actually start relatively small. So the cartoon drawing looks something like the following. You um, Use the sun to illuminate uh, photovoltaics. The photovoltaics convert the sunlight into electrical power. The electrical power drives a phased array of lasers. The lasers then hit the target um, or power a spacecraft or beam power to some distant outposts or help you with terraforming. Or you know, There's a whole slew of things I can talk about here. Um, and so one of the questions I often get is, why bother to convert sunlight into electricity in order to convert it back into light? Right, it seems kind of stupid, right? Why convert photons into electrical power back into photons? Why don't you just use the sun itself? And I get this question all the time, even from professors who teach optics. And the answer is, um, it doesn't work, uh, at least for mirrors that are of any reasonable size. If you wanted to evaporate a rocky asteroid from the Earth that was, say, one AU away from you, you would need a mirror the size of the solar system. Why? Because the sun is not a point source. It's not a point of light. It has finite size. And you cannot get flux on target, which is larger than the surface power uh, from the source. It actually goes like one over the F, four times the F number squared. So you need about an F1 optic, which means you need a diameter roughly equal to the target distance. So that doesn't work even though there are designs out there to put a mirror on the moon, for example. It's, it's not going to work, at least for rocky targets. Now what can work is put a mirror near an asteroid. That does work. OK, what enables this? Um, it's everybody in this room who's carried their magic you know, box with them. right? You carry your magic box. You have a flashlight. You use photonics in your life. So photonics has driven us to the point where we can efficiently not only convert light into electricity, but electricity into light. Okay? So if I had a laser pointer, which I don't have, but if I had a laser pointer, it would be another example of a semiconductor being um, used to convert electricity into light. But what's key for us is you have to have a coherent, relatively coherent source of light, and you have to be able to phase lock it. And that's what allows the system to work. So just as an example, photovoltaics, the side which converts light into electricity, is now about 50% efficient for at least for concentrated solar and about 40% or at least mid-30% efficient for non-concentrated solar uh, in space. So that was um, relatively recent. OK, so the basic idea is, is the following. If you want to hit a target and do something useful, you could either um, evaporate it or deflect it. Those are sort of the two basic ideas here. If you take a high intensity beam, the same way that you laser machine or you laser cut clothes, you can um, evaporate the material directly. But in the process, you actually create a plume which turns into a rocket on the target. OK, so the basic idea is you evaporate slowly uh, rather than like in uh, Star Trek or Star Wars, you know, blast things out of the sky. 
and you decide what you want to go after. So a comet, for example, is easier to go after than a rocky asteroid. So we set an incredibly conservative, ambitious goal just, just to see what would happen and say, suppose we want to completely vaporize a 500 meter diameter asteroid. I mean, that's an extremely ambitious goal for anyone that works in this business. Um, and it turns out, if you do the, run the math, which we run um, a lot of, then you need a, a fairly large structure of order a few kilometers to 10 kilometers inside to completely obliterate an asteroid to the molecular level. But you don't need to do that. Because once you begin the evaporation process, you produce an enormous rocket um, on the asteroid itself. You turn the asteroid into a rocket engine. So for example, um, I'll show you in a bit, uh, something like this that would completely evaporate it would turn the asteroid into the equivalent of a shuttle, um, an SRB, a shuttle a solid rocket booster. Okay, so our goal was to try to see could we start interdiction, i.e. could we begin mitigation when the target is very far away. So we chose one AU just because we want to choose A number and the consequences of that for us were that we hit a spot which is about 30 minute meters in diameter. But as I say, this is extraordinarily conservative. But what's interesting about this is that it's not, it's not actually beyond the ability for humans to do this at all. And the system is completely modular. So you can build small ones and do things with them immediately and then work your way up the food chain. So I wanted to show you some things just from a historical perspective. Um, since you live in the Silicon Valley, Valley you should appreciate this. This is the um, cost per megabyte, dollars per megabyte versus year. And if you look at the, the curves, I mean, they're unbelievable. So I started using uh, desktop computers um, in 1980. Okay, so in, in 1980, the cost for a megabyte of RAM was uh, $1,000. So it was a million dollars a gigabyte. A million dollars a gigabyte. So you go to Fry's today, and what do you pay for a gigabyte of memory? What does an eight gigabyte memory stick cost you today? <coughs> nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Okay, nothing's even better if you get a you know, discount. Unfortunately, that wasn't possible. But you, the can't, buy it. you can't buy it, right? <laughs> okay, thank you. Very clever. You can stay. All right. So <laughs> the cost had dropped to an um, I, If someone had told me in 1980, ah, oh, you'll be able to buy, you know, a gigabyte for a dollar when it was a million dollars in 1980, I would say, come on, you're full of it. But they weren't full of it. No one said it to me. But just look at the trend and you'll see where we're going. It's a very nice uh, trend, which, you know, sometimes is called Moore's Law, somewhat incorrectly, but uh, it's a good, good term to list. Number of transistors as a function of year, you know, enormous. We're up to billions on a, on a device, whereas back in the 70s, we were at the, you know, hundreds to thousands range. I mean, just unbelievable trends in technology. Pixels per dollar. Um, this is Kodak, uh, pixels per dollar versus year, right? Pixels per dollar, thousand, ten thousand, hundred. You know, now you can buy in your phone, you know, this is a CMOS chip, 10 megapixels, and costs about a buck to produce. Unbelievable progress. Photonics has just gone, photonics and microelectronics has just gone um, to amazing extremes for us um, just because technologically it's possible. The same thing is possible here. So some other things, calculations per second per thousand dollars. Again, just enormous changes. Um, in technology. And you're all used to this, you just perhaps don't think about it. Some things which are slower are things like efficiency in photovoltaics. So this is from NREL, and if you look at the efficiency in percent versus year, it's not going up very rapidly, first of all, because it's already pretty high, so it can't go up very rapidly. And we're currently pushing 50%, right? 44% is the maximum here. Um, sorry, can't reach up there. Um, and in concentrated PV, these are non-concentrated typically. In concentrated PV, we're already at 50%. So it's in a very good place to be. Um, costs are, are dropping dramatically. So this is uh, module price in dollars, uh, dollars per watt in 2008, dollars you know, versus uh, sales. So the more you produce something, the cheaper it becomes in this arena. 
Okay, another thing that's not changing very rapidly is the cost to launch. How much does it cost to launch a kilogram? Terribly slow. You know, how much have rockets improved in the last 2,000 years? <laughs> how much have they improved in terms of bulk chemical efficiency? And the answer is what? Very little. We know how to make big ones. We know how to control them better. We know how to do things more efficiently. But the basic chemistry of a rocket is little changed in 1,000 years. There's some improvements. Okay, it's not zero. But it's not on the kind of trend that I showed you, which is factors of a million. It's not. So very slowly changing. So we need to have a paradigm change there if we want to do things um, differently in space. So directed energy is all around you. It's in your DVD player. Um, it's in your laser pointer. Here's some just pretty pictures here. Um, here's a nice example of sort of from small um, on the chip level up to the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore um, to here was a report that came out a few days ago. Um, Lockheed Martin um, has now achieved about 30 kilowatts um, in a single fiber laser, but they did a trick. It was, I'm going there tomorrow, so I can't say anything too bad, but they, they had a trick where what they did was they wavelength combine um, into a single uh, fiber. But nonetheless, these things are increasing very rapidly, and they're already appearing in, in tactical weaponry. So here's an example of a, uh, a high energy laser for theater, um, not that kind of theater, but military theater. <coughs> Okay, here's single mode fiber um, power versus time. Um, and again, the trend's pretty rapid, uh, but it's actually already larger than we need, to be honest. So this is power in a single, uh, single mode in a single fiber. Euterbium fibers at a micron are already up at several thousand watts. Uh, and we actually only, we need less than a thousand. So we're already there in terms of power per unit. We need the um, mass to drop a bit, but not too much. We're currently at about five kilograms per kilowatt. We'd like it to come down to about one. Okay. How about optics? Well, most of you are thinking of optics in terms of grinding a mirror. Okay, but here's a radically different type of technology. This is a film, thin film piece of plastic. It was a Lawrence Livermore DARPA um, ball program. It's 30 microns thick, and it's about 60 grams per square meter. And it works really, potentially, really well for our application, potentially. There's some issues, but it's actually getting, um, it, has a, it has a possibility of working very well for us. Okay, there's all kinds of other ways of dealing with a threat. You can hit them by running into them. So we could take all the used cars and throw them at asteroids, one of my favorites, okay, or throw out um, old, uh, newspapers, we could throw our trash at them. Um, you can use a gravity tractor by just kind of going by and pulling on them with gravity. You can use an iron thruster. Um, we're working on a, a small version of, of our program that we call Starlight, which is basically a stand-on approach application rather than stand-off for small missions. Uh, but actually one of the most efficient ways to, to deflect an asteroid, if that's what we want to do, is land on the asteroid and just throw rock. That's one of the most efficient things to do. You land on it, <clears throat> and you just lob rocks, because the escape velocity from an asteroid is tiny. And since the, the power goes like the square of the speed, whereas the thrust goes proportional speed, you're much better in terms of thrust per unit watt per unit watt by landing and throwing off rocks. Nuclear weapons, these are the most fun, right? You've got to admit. Right? <laughs> My friends that work at Lawrence Livermore in Los Alamos, they have a, that's just, it's got to be such a fun job. Um, it's just you can't use them anymore. Right? You can't blow them up in the atmosphere. You can't blow them up underground. I mean, what is it? You, know, you can't have fun anymore. So, you know, I like this approach. I'm very much in favor of this. Okay. But all these require a dedicated mission per threat. And you better not just have one dedicated mission. You better have several, because if you miss the first one, you got a problem. Okay. Now, it turns out that in our approach, you can actually propel a, uh, what we'll call a kinetic kill vehicle mode, or even a nuclear tipped one with, um, with our system. But we'll talk too much about this. Here's a nuclear weapons-based approach, Lawrence Livermore and Los Alamos. 
You take one of the nuclear weapons out of our arsenal. This is a B-83, sort of megaton yield weapon, and launch it on a, a Delta IV Heavy, um, and then kablammo. And if you want to do a better job, you run into it a bit, you extend an arm, plow, make a little hole first with a shaped charge and a rod, and then come in and hit it with a nuclear weapon. So there's been all kinds of interesting studies on this. Um, my friend Dave Dearborn up at Livermore has done just great work on that, as have a number of other people's. Um, people. One thing you'd like to avoid is the sort of um, the Shoemaker-Levy problem where an uh, object comes in and breaks up before it hits, because then you've got lots of targets to hit, whereas in our case we can do that. So all these approaches are stand-on approaches where you've got to go to the target. Our approach is stand-off, except the photons go to the target, but you only need one mission. Okay. All right. So if you look at the periodic table and you ask yourself, what does it take to evaporate material? So if you do materials processing, you're from the semiconductor industry, you're very familiar with this. Here's vapor pressure versus temperature for a variety of elements on the periodic table. So we ran every single element on the periodic table uh, that made sense. We've run 90 so far, and this is what you get. So this is the same data, but we've now parameterized them in a, in a somewhat more systematic form. And as you can see, by the time you get to 3,000 Kelvin or so, the vapor pressure has become very large for essentially every element of the periodic table. But a lot of things you're going after are not um, just elements, they're compounds. If you convert temperature into flux, you need to get up between a, a megawatt and a few tens of megawatts per square meter. That's the magic number. You need about 10 megawatts a square meter to hit a target. We then have been running all kinds of compounds. Here's um, typical compounds that asteroids are made of, magnesium oxide, silicon oxide, zinc, sulfide, aluminum oxides. Again, a few thousand Kelvin um, is what you need, sort of blowtorch temperatures. Flux is basically the same, same kind of curve. You compare them, 10 megawatts a square meter, and you're in business. Everything goes. Then we have to model asteroids thermally, so we spend a lot of time modeling them um, in terms of thermal conductivity. Thermal conductivity is relatively small for large asteroids because they're basically <coughs> rock piles. So I won't bore you with all the mathematical details, but we spent a lot of our time modeling. So here's spot temperature, um, uh, assuming 50% efficiency versus array size versus target distance. I won't bore you, but you basically, um, if you have an array size between a kilometer and 10 kilometers, you can take care of any, any known threat even up to the kilometer class. You don't need to do that, however. OK, so and I, you probably don't want to see all this crap. So here's a laboratory test um, just to check some of our numbers. So this is a, a thermal infrared picture. You'll see the laser come on in a moment. This is what it looks like in the visible over here. And you'll see some people's arms. One point gets cut off a little bit. I'm probably sorry about that. Likely the blood doesn't show up too much in the infrared, so. Okay, so the laser goes on, the target is hit here, and you can see um, both ejection, you'll see heating as well. Um, it goes off scale um, because it gets so hot. So it's roughly 3,000 3, Kelvin here. It looks like a light bulb going off in the, uh, in the laboratory. I work with a lot of students, the kids love it. They bring in all kinds of stuff. They bring in cell phones from their roommates. Um, <laughs> They tell them, bring in their cell phone cases and say they want a blaster hole in it. <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, this is a high school student who's been working with us. Um, I told them, you know, go down to the beach and grab some sand and let's uh, turn it into glass. So they went and grabbed some sand and we turned it into glass. Um, it's actually great fun. To be honest, usually stuff I do is not nearly so much fun. And then the same students uh, do 3D uh, simulations. So we take all the physics which you can look at in our papers, and we run it into a, a large-scale computer model, and then we model what happens in the uh, interaction. And the, the bottom line is that within about one second, the temperature reaches uh, roughly 3,000 Kelvin, a little bit less than 3,000 Kelvin. And that's what our laboratory, you turn on the laser, it lights up almost immediately. Uh, and it's just a question of, of energy balance. So, okay, well, so let me blow through a lot of this material, because, um, well, then one of our students actually liked video games, so he, I said, here, take the physics equations and make a little animation. 
So this is a physics-based animation, not just a, a toy animation. Um, and you can see the, the plume coming off, which is a rocket, um, and then the asteroid heating to, uh, at least in the spot, to about 3,000 Kelvin. We've done all kinds of modeling, 2D, 3D, um, you name it. Uh, we looked at jitter, pointing jitter, because it's hard to hit a target this far away. Uh, it turns out that jitter is not nearly as significant a problem as I thought it would be, because even as you're jittering, you're heating and the fluxes are high enough that it stays hot. The decay time is um, long enough that it still, still works. OK, then we looked at jitter in the laboratory and computed mass ejection versus sigma, assuming a Gaussian beam, produced similar plots. Um, again, I don't want to bore you with all this, but um, it's in our papers if you want to look at it. But the thing which I think is interesting for the SETI group is this is not just for uh, defense. Because if we, if we knew with certainty that we weren't going to be hit by a significant asteroid for 1,000 years, what would you do? That's right, nothing. Right? Why bother? Well, we don't know that. But anyway, if that was the sole purpose of this, I would say I'm not so sure this is the way to go. Nuclear weapons are a nice approach, I like big explosions. Um, but there are other ways to do it, too. But we can vaporize space debris, which is an issue. We can deorbit space debris. We can use it in a LIDAR mode for active illumination, which we have a paper coming on that. We can do remote composition analysis via gas phase molecular absorption. You can drive a spacecraft by photon pressure. So I'll show you that. It's actually quite interesting. You can beam power to a distant spacecraft. You can run in a downlooking mode if you want to send power to the ground. Um, my friend Keith um, works on this a lot for different purposes. Um, you can use plume thrust for orbit modification and capture of an asteroid, um, something of interest to the ARM people. Um, and if you want to just deflect asteroids, it turns out that for, at least for a class four system, you get to order the shuttle thrust on the asteroid. Okay. So we've run a number of molecular lines, uh, which turn out to be very complicated to compute. So we have colleagues in uh, London that are doing this with us. And these are cross sections as a function of wavelength. They're very strongly changing due to molecular uh, vibrational and, trend and um, rotational lines. So we did an analysis of a target at 1 AU and ran a, a full analysis assuming the absorption lines and the thermal emission, and this is what you see. So in theory, it's possible to look at composition from very, very large distances. Well, this would be extremely interesting for understanding the composition of asteroids. What about rotation? Asteroids rotate. Turns out that large asteroids, which are largely rock piles don't rotate faster than about once every two hours. It's a very simple physics calculation if you um, have, have taken some college or high school physics. And when you look at the data, you see here's the data in frequency per day. Here's 10, which is one every 2.4 hours. And look at that. It's remarkable. I mean, when the first time I saw this, I thought, oh my goodness, you know, it's amazing that the simple calculation works for large asteroids. For smaller bodies, they can be um, significantly molecularly bound rather than just gravitationally bound. Then we did 3D simulations. You've got to keep these kids busy, otherwise they're going to go out and you know, hang out in Isla Vista. Um, so they've been doing 3D uh, rotating asteroid simulations, which is a real trick. You can drive a spacecraft. Um, so in this case, you don't leave you don't leave home with your propulsion system. You leave your propulsion system at home. So this is sort of a railgun approach. You blast it out. It's not what you want for you know, the 100-year Starship program. Ideally, you'd like to use antimatter or something like that. But it works uh, rather nicely for some purposes. So for example, you could get a 1,000-kilogram robotic craft um, out to a 1 AU in about a week or so. It takes about three days to get 100 kilogram and uh, a little over a week to get 1,000 kilograms and about 30 days to get 10,000 kilograms out to 1 AU. That's the good news. Um, and at 1 AU, we can get going 1,200 kilometers per second for 100 kilogram spacecraft, which is larger than the escape velocity of the galaxy, by the way. There's one minor problem, which is, I don't know how to stop, but okay. <laughs> Um, you could, in theory, ping pong these things if you were a more advanced civilization. But it is intriguing. One could imagine 
a interstellar probe now that gets up to about, actually this goes to about 3% at the edge of the solar system. Um, one could imagine some things now that um, you could do with this technology. So we've designed reflectors. We actually went out and designed real reflectors, not just hypothetical ones. There's no graphene. There's, we didn't assume any nanotechnology here. This is just uh, thin film mylar with coatings. Okay. And whatever. There's all kinds of things here. Uh, then we looked at relativistic beam propulsion. This is in our papers. Um, I'm not going to bore you with this. But you can uh, drive a spacecraft at really high speeds. And more than that, you can actually send back the data at incredibly high speeds. So for SETI, I think the important thing here is this. Suppose you ask the question, what is the communications possibility with this technology? Suppose you want to use this as a laser communicator. Okay? And you want to, for example, ask yourself if you were to explore the Kepler exoplanets, the Kepler discovered planets, and you wanted to go out 1,000 light years Okay, what communication rate would you have? And the answer is, you'd have an enormous communication rate. Um, you'd basically have Wi-Fi at 1,000 light years. Of course, it'd take you 1,000 years to get 2,000 years maybe to get a response, but whatever. Uh, we're patient. So we ran all kinds of, of uh, links. So if you run, if you know anything about uh, uh, radio astronomy, you can run link calculations. Here we just run them for um, optical links. And the bottom line, is that if I had a very modest spacecraft, which is about 10 watts on board, 10 watts, not very much, 10 watts on the spacecraft, the spacecraft back to the Earth would be, at 70 light years, would be about um, 60 kilobits per second with 10 watts. OK, 8 megabits per second at 6 light years. So this is, these are amazing speeds to ponder. OK, we could stream, streamline the other way. If you want to go. Earth the spacecraft, you could go at terabits per second. Okay. So think about that in terms of exoplanets. What does that mean? Now, one thing I did very recently was just go farther. How bright would this be? At 1,000 light years, it's extraordinarily bright. It's brighter than the brightest star in our sky, with the exception of the sun. What about at intergalactic distances? Suppose you went to Andromeda and asked the question, how bright would you be? The answer is, you're still incredibly bright, not brighter than the brightest star in the sky, but still easily detectable. <coughs> the bottom line is that one giga light year, at one billion light years, which is a non-trivial fraction of the universe, um, you would still be at about two megabits per second. That's, just think about it. Just, if you think about SETI searches, just think about it. This is taking, two, by the way, the assumption here is take two units. Assume that another technology is the same sophistication as us. And just face them at each other. And ask yourself, what does that mean? It's about 20 kilobits per second at 10 giga light years, essentially the entire universe. That's a profound number, if you think about it. OK, so you can look at our papers. Here's the photometric magnitude if you um, study astronomy. This is magnitude versus distance. Here's light years up at the top. We're about 30th magnitude at a giga light year, which sounds like dim, but it's not actually that dim. Even Hubble could just about detect it. And that's a tiny mirror. So in order to do this, you have to throw in the background. So um, I do a lot of background modeling, because my, back, my background is in backgrounds, literally. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a joke, but only if you're, only if you're a total nerd. Um, so one thing you have to put in is the cosmic infrared background, because that's important here, um, which we did. And you have to put in the zodiacal um, background in our solar system, which we did. And then the CMB is unimportant. Um, OK, so we've done a lot of signal-to-noise calculations. Um, the issue for us is that the bandwidth is extremely narrow. That's why it works. It's extremely narrow. So we are extraordinarily bright compared to the sun per unit bandwidth. We are just unbelievable. We're about 10 to the 13 times, 10 trillion times brighter than the sun per unit bandwidth. That's why one small unit, one modest human unit on the Earth, can appear uh, all the way across the universe. Of course, it takes you know, billions of years to get there, but it's something to think about philosophically. Long-range power communication, 
Um, at one AU, you're about 50 megawatts a square meter. So if you want to project power, that works really well. Um, and again, it works very well for defense if that's what you want to use it for. You can power distance spacecraft, you can recharge them, you can uh, power ion engines. Um, at 300 years, 300 AU, sorry, um, it's still quite large. All right, spread out over 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer beam size. Okay, that's the same as the size of us, so you can project roughly 1 AU solar power out to 300 AU. So then we looked at active illumination of asteroids, which I think is one of the more interesting things that comes out of this for defense purposes. Um, and the bottom line is it works extremely well for illumination, again, because the bandwidth is very narrow and the source is very bright. So there's a paper on this that looks at how long um, it takes to do a sky survey. So we can detect things down to tens of meters um, in blind surveys, which is really interesting. So I want to leave you with just a couple thoughts before we stop. Um, suppose that you really were a uh, searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. Suppose that you, this was SETI. Okay, suppose that this was the SETI Institute. <laughs> and you wanted to ponder an advanced civilization. Well, if you think about it, um, the sun is a very wasteful way to send um, power out. First of all, most of it misses the Earth and all the other planets. So why bother? Right? It seems very inefficient. So some of you may or may not have ever heard of, of a term attributed to Freeman Dyson, who actually doesn't like the term attributed to him, but it's too late. Um, can't take it back at this point. Where an advanced civilization hangs out around a star, uses the power from the star as a gigantic fusion reactor, and then you know, kind of lives on that structure around the star. I mean, it kind of makes sense, at least good in science fiction novels. Um, but there's a better way, I would say. If you're an advanced civilization to do that, why don't you take the power from the sun and convert it into directed energy? Because you can do much more interesting things with that. So if you did that, you could do amazing things. Now, I don't really want to do that, but you could um, do things on a planetary scale, which would be pretty scary. So I just want you to think about this. Um, if you were a truly advanced civilization and could master that, which we call the Dyson Sphere, but now reconvert it into a directed energy uh, mode, you would have something which would move planets, literally. Um, you could move entire planets with it. I'm not suggesting you do that. but. OK, um, so I have a whole thing on technology here. But I think what I'll do is I'm going to stop here. And I'd like to open up for some questions. I think the questions that are most appropriate for SETI are, are basically the following. <clears throat> if what I said is correct, that we can conceive of building something which is visible across most of the universe, why don't we see them? If they're at least as advanced as us, beaming to us, why don't we see them? Well, there's some possibilities. One, they're not there. Okay. Two, they're not interested in us. They didn't turn the lights on. Okay. Three, they're not aiming at us. That's not really a good argument because you, you run the numbers and that's not a good argument. Okay. Okay. There's a profound philosophical issue here that you should ponder. And the fourth, which is the most important one, is we're not looking properly. So this, um, which I think I will end here, um, but I want you to think about that in the question period. Um, I've had a, a large number of people working on this, actually more than here. It, um, one thing I've found, I, I, I teach for a living. Uh, it's, it's cheaper than um, institutionalization. Um, they keep a lot of us in universities for that reason. Also NASA labs are similar, by the way. Um, is that students just love this. Students just, they absolutely love it. It's some innate desire for students to destroy things. That's what I found. <laughs> they just love to burn things up. And if they could, they'd blow them up. But I don't allow them to blow it up. So there's a lot of people here. Um, so I'm going to stop here and then take some questions. Thank you. Um, Philip, you mentioned that there, there would be um, uh, terraforming implications um, Did I say that? I wasn't supposed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, just, I, I run numbers for a living. I mean, I just, I live to, to calculate. Uh, it's just weird, but. Um, 
So if you ask what would you do with directed energy, you know, besides um, do nefarious things, which of course immediately come to mind, um, but I prefer not to go there. Um, and you ask, with these kind of flux levels, let's just start with something close by. Start with the moon. So say you want to, um, say I want to write Adrian was here on the moon, okay? I mean, that would be a logical thing to do, right? <laughs> if, if, if Adrian was in charge and just says, let's just write a little G code program for this thing, and we'll program it to write Adrian was here. Okay, so you could, you could terraform parts of the moon if you want. Okay, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, works great. Then you ask the question, what about Mars? Can we do anything on Mars? So we actually ran a simulation of the Martian atmosphere going through the Martian atmosphere. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, looks like you could do something. Um, but then, of course, the question is, well, what about pointing downward? You know, what could you do if you pointed downward? So, uh, first of all, you've got to be very careful in pointing downward. <laughs> um, so we, we ran a calculation of saying, you know, one way to prevent this from being weaponized, and actually this doesn't actually work the way you'd like it to, but you could put it on an atmospheric absorption line because there are lots of atmospheric absorption lines. We run atmospheric models up the wazoo in, in my place for lots of different missions. And so this is a transmission of the atmosphere versus wavelength. So one micron's here, which is a nice transmission band through the atmosphere, but you could put it here. There's a nice absorption band here and here. But let's say you were more advanced than we are, not so primitive, so you wouldn't turn it on you know, your friends or enemies, and you wanted to do things on the Earth. What could you do with it? Um, just just imagine a 3,000 Kelvin, 30 meter diameter uh, beam, and you know, imagine what you could do with that. Now, don't go to the bad side. Don't go to the dark side, because there's no dark side. This is very bright. So you can only go to the, the light side. You can't go to the dark side, okay, luckily. Um, you could, uh, you know, literally uh, change the landscape. Um, now, one thing we looked at that I think is a more interesting problem is could you do weather modification? Okay, so we looked at storm mitigation. So storms cause about $100 billion per year in damage, approximately, and um, large-scale loss of life. That in itself uh, is an intriguing problem. And so I've run some numbers, but what I need is a good um, atmospheric physicist to run detailed simulations. Because the sort of models that I can run, which are very simplistic and not realistic, um, give numbers which are quite encouraging in terms of energy into a storm uh, being comparable to the energy of the storm. So therefore, you might be able to do something to mitigate it. Now, this would be an extremely dangerous area to enter unless you did it right, because you could obviously have the opposite effect. So there are implications here. I don't know that we're um, capable of dealing with those any more than if I gave you a kilogram of antimatter at the moment, I know what you would do with it. Okay, and it wouldn't be pretty. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, you know, are we prepared for some things? But yes, you could terraform. You could terraform on, an, on a planetary, interplanetary scale. Luckily, if we shine the beam on the uh, Kepler exoplanets, no one's asked me this question yet, but I'll tell you the answer. No, you don't vaporize them, okay? And yes, I did run the number for what it would take to put Pluto out of its misery since it's now been demoted, but I won't tell you the answer to that one, okay? Okay. Question. Any other? Yes. Hi. Um, <clears throat> in addition to thoughts about terraforming Mars, some of us who are, are Mars fans are sad that eventually Phobos's orbit will decay as it is slowly spiraling in towards the planet. So could you put one of these things on Mars and give Phobos a little boost, and how hard would that be? Yeah. So I, we actually ran some calculations recently, and I, I can't go into it here because it's actually kind of gross. but. Um, and we're on, we're on YouTube, okay. So every, everything we say here uh, can and will be used against us. But yes, uh, in the same way that the asteroid becomes a rocket when you hit it, everything else becomes a rocket when you hit it. Um, so there are a couple ways to play this game. You could have an ion engine on board and then power the ion engine with this with much more power than you get with conventional solar panels. But think in the case of the, the asteroid retrieval mission, which all of you probably heard about this. Right. First we were going back to the moon, then we were going to Mars, now we're going to uh, an asteroid, right? Yes? Okay, and the next administration will 
do whatever. Okay. Um, I wish we'd just do one of these things, and then we wouldn't have to say this. But so on the asteroid retrieval mission, there are ion engines on board. In order for an ion engine to work, you have to have what? An Both ion and an power. engine. Okay, so it makes sense. Where do the ions come from? You carry fuel. Okay, on the ARM mission, there's a considerable amount of xenon on um, which is being carried. You can carry other things too. So one possibility is to not use that as the fuel to deflect the asteroid or to change the orbit, but to use the asteroid itself, which has lots of fuel, called the asteroid. So this Starlight mission is actually, look at that. Could you use the asteroid itself, create a rocket thrust, and use that as the engine instead of an ion engine? So in the case of your question, I think there's different ways to do it. Um, you could just obliterate the mission, and that solves your problem, right? It's not coming down. So. Um, but if you want to actually boost it up into orbit, one way to do this is to, you could A, use photon pressure. Okay, that's a possibility. Uh, that, that's a possibility. It's non trivial amount of photon pressure here. As I mentioned, it's about 470 newtons for the system we're looking at. Um, that's in, when you reflect it. Or about, anyway, it's a order of 500 newtons or so. That's not trivial at all. The, uh, the arm thrusters, for example, if you look at the ion engine, the arm mission, uh, they're about 1.5 newtons. Okay, so this would be much larger than that. Of course, it's not a fair comparison, but just to give you some scale. So yes, uh, boosting things into higher orbit is definitely a possibility. Um, if you talk to Keith back here, he'll <laughs> talk to you about uses of similar technology to go from low Earth orbit up into geo. Um, if you talk to Kevin, you know, we'd like to go from Earth to orbit, not by chemical propulsion, but by beam power propulsion. When Kevin's working on um, microwave millimeter, another possibility is, is laser. So there's, there's different ways to do this. And there's some other things I could talk to you offline about. Um, but it, it has a lot of different applications. Just a so, couple since, of last questions. Fine. Yeah, Hi. since you mentioned me, uh, uh, 30, 3 gigawatts is enough to support 500,000 tons a year to geosynchronous. That's not enough to end the energy problem, but it's enough to demonstrate that you can sure do it. Um, right, so, so this is uh, uh, Keith Henson from, the, I guess, the L5 Society is what you used. Yeah, originally. Yeah, originally, so. Um, anyway, so uh, Keith is very interested in using a similar technology to boost from LEO to GEO, and then a GEO to uh, um, make a large scale uh, solar uh, PV satellites then beam their energy back, power back to the ground via uh, using microwaves or millimeter waves. Okay, so it's kind of the old um, SPS mode, the solar um, the space power satellite mode, but in a new format here. And in, in a very interesting format because you can drive a spacecraft up into orbit this way. So I, you know, as, as much as some of this may be uh, new and, and, and perhaps uh, very different from what you used to think about. If you close your eyes and you ignore this, you ignore a couple of things. First of all, the technology is going to happen whether you close your eyes or not. Secondly, if you open your eyes and ask, what can I do with this technology? I've shown you one thing which should dramatically um, change your perception, which is that you could project a beam um, across most of the universe and be seen by another civilization. That should tweak your imagination in some way. I mean, that's a, that's a profoundly interesting statement to me, philosophically, as well as technologically. And that's just where we are today. Imagine a 1,000 years from now. This will be nothing. Okay. So can I ask a couple of questions from the SETI side of the house? Yes. Um, you mentioned uh, not, ha not having looked correctly. Is that simply the fact that we haven't used the narrowband reception devices that you would need, and it's all diluted with a broadband receiver? Yeah, so when you, when you run the numbers, um, uh, what is your name? Jill. You're Jill. Yeah, I, thought, I know you. <laughs> From years ago in Berkeley. Yes. Yeah, okay. Hi, Jill. I thought it was you. I <laughs> didn't want to. We both got older. Yeah, we both got older. Yes. <laughs> Why do you say that? Yeah, we did both get older. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't even see you without my glasses. So. Um, Hi, Julie. I, I would love to talk to you about this. So he, here's, here's the issue. Um, so uh, 
there's a couple issues here. One, nor normally in many SETI programs, people look at what's in sort of an interesting anthropomorphic window to look at. So you know, the so-called water hole um, around a gigahertz and, and a half, you know, is, is a common window to think about, just to think about. I mean, just, you have to think about these things in some format. I'm not saying that, that this is an anthropomorphically interesting argument. I'm not saying there's anything natural about ytterbium lasing at 1064 nanometers. It's a little bit different argument in that case. What I'm saying is if you look at the narrow band nature of the line and ask and do a, a signal link calculation, the same way you do for a, a radio receiver, first of all, the forward gain on this system if you're used to thinking, I don't know how many, any radio astronomers in the audience? Um, Michael, you're, you're one. Okay, so what's the highest forward gain you've ever used, Michael? What's the highest forward gain signal. you've ever used in a, in a radar system? Forward gain. About 80 dB or so. Okay, so this is 200 plus dB in forward gain. Okay, so first of all, you get an, in why? Because you have shorter wavelengths. So the, the gain goes like, d squared over lambda squared, where d is the, the size, or effective baseline. So we get enormous forward gain, and we have very narrow bandwidth. Now, radio has very narrow bandwidth, too. Okay? But you combine those together with the backgrounds being extremely low. This is in photons per square meter per second per square second per micron. But the bandwidth is of order 10 to the minus 9 microns or so. And it actually can be 10 to the minus 12 microns if you want to push it. So the, the photon count rates from the backgrounds, which is what we focused on in this calculation, are extremely low. Um, and there's a different kind of, of quantization limit than you have in the radio where you have the 3M, the, the 3 Kelvin CMB as a, as a background. Um, so th the answer to your question, I think, was, was a little more generic. You know. Are we not seeing this because we're not looking, they're not transmitting, you know, some other combination? And I don't think we pushed hard enough in that direction. You know, Horowitz at Harvard was looking at, at this for a while, the sort of optical SETI. Uh, still doing that. He's still, and he, he's still doing it. What I would claim is that one should think a little bit outside the, you know, few meter class telescope. If we're looking at advanced civilization, I hope they're not using few meter class telescopes. We should be thinking larger scale than that. With this kind of system, which is conceivable to build, you're talking about going out gigalight years. And that's, I, I think that has to be profoundly uh, interesting and disturbing to people. So, all right, so with the optical SETI programs, they've been eliminating the background by uh, temporal filtering, yeah. looking for pulses that are a nanosecond or less, as opposed to the spectral filtering you were just talking about. Yeah. So uh, it seems to me that we haven't looked with detectors that would have the capability, and we're we're trying to push them down into the infrared and yes. get to these frequencies, but yes. but we're doing a different kind of technician. Okay, so so for the for the people who are the really technically uh, interested in, in in the audience, uh, there's a few things. First of all, being on the ground and one micron is not so bad. Being on the ground and say five microns is so bad. Okay, or ten microns is it's terrible because the atmosphere. Once you go into space, this is the fundamental background that you're limited by. Uh, this is the so-called cosmic infrared background, which is the sum of all infrared galaxy mission that we know about. Okay, so if, if, if this is of interest to people, um, this is sort of a fundamental background you have to deal with. We're looking at a CW rather than a pulsed situation. People looked pulsed because you can produce high power in short time periods historically. Right, so you can produce, you know, gigawatts, terawatts, you know, petawatts now um, up at NIF with um, a short pulse. But it's actually a, an average power which yields detectability. Now, there, there are different ways to slice that, so I don't want to just leave it at that because it depends on the backgrounds. You can integrate a, a CW signal and get the same seal to noise ratio as you get in a single pulse depending on the backgrounds, okay? So if you frown, we should go over the details. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's a technical question of backgrounds. Um, here, I don't think we've had enough energy, personal energy, into going to searching for what might be a better way for a different way, not better, a different way for technology to announce its presence. If we wanted to, with such a system, we could shine our, our beam on every Kepler exoplanet 
and send out enormously bright signals and just keep doing it over and over and over again if we wanted to do that. And so that becomes an interesting thing to think about. So one of the reasons I'm up here is I want to engage in a conversation about this um, because we, we, we always have, as I do, a very you know, anthropomorphic centered discussion. We don't have anything else, so that's what we got. This is now another way to look at it. So if from the SETI point of view we wanted to avoid the weaponization, yeah. um, could you combine lower power beams with gravitational lensing? to produce a really strong signal yeah, on your target. Okay, yes. So the problem uh, typically with gravitational lenses from just a purely technical point of view is they're usually not quite necessarily where you want them to be. Um, and, and you're absolutely right, Jill. You could, you, could, um, sorry. Yeah, you could take a beam at low power and have a giant lens which focuses, which gives you higher flux on target but arranging the gravitational lens to just be at the right place for when you want to hit the target is, is not something under our control at the moment, or this part is. Weaponization, unfortunately, is going to happen no matter what, in my opinion. It's just going to happen. Now, the, the way to handle that is, A, put yourself in an absorption line, but you know that's not going to happen also, um, or B, come to international agreements like we have on nuclear weapons in space now, um, Technically, it's weapons of mass destruction space, but there's different ways to look at that. Um, and, and I think that's the, the way to handle it is by international agreement. A program like this should be an international program, not, you know, would you be upset if North Korea put one of these up? You know, well, I think some people in the United States might be slightly upset. Sorry about those who are on YouTube in North Korea, but luckily there's no YouTube in North Korea. Um, <laughs> sorry about that if you're listening. Um, I, 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 the question of weaponization comes up, um, I think it has to be handled by uh, agreement, frankly. Unfortunately, I know there are other questions out there, um, but we're going to have to um, cut it short so that uh, we can respect the, the wishes of the North Koreans on YouTube that, okay. that we would just shut up about North Korea. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. There's no slide in there at all, Philip. No, no. no. <laughs> Just my voice. They'll come after me. <laughs> so, um, but I do encourage you to come up and talk to Philip uh, directly after his talk before he escapes uh, with his new mug, oh. um, which is a special SETI mug. And it's got uh, a couple of robots. I'm sure they're Jill, talking together. I, I can't read it without my glasses. Okay. I they're, got older. They're talking together about which uh, wavelengths to receive our optical SETI oh, uh, org. signal okay. on. Okay, thank you. Please Appreciate join me in thanking Philip for his great talk. Thank you all for 